Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the online conference, Philosophy and Generative Grammar. If any of you doesn't have your conference program, you can find it in the link that Rafael is posting on the chat. Without further ado, let's begin. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the session, Professor Brenda Laca from Universidad de la República. Um, the talk that she is giving today is titled Formal Semantics Meets Variation and Change. Brenda. So thank you very much. Let me start sharing my screen, if I may. So, so can everybody see my screen? Yeah, perfect. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this and the participants for this very interesting meeting, for this very interesting conference, and uh, also for inviting me to contribute to it. You see, it is always a little bit intimidating for the descriptive linguist that I am to speak before an audience of philosophers. I have tried to select material that uh, such an audience uh, might uh, find interesting. Well, let's see this. We will see if I succeeded in, in this attempt. Now here is the roadmap. Oh, here is the roadmap, sorry. Here is the roadmap uh, that uh, I would like to take you along. We will most probably not reach the end of the road in time, but I will be happy to supply uh, the slides we might not be able to, to discuss for, for those who are interested. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it won't be a bad thing if we don't get to cover all this material. I will start by giving some historical background showing how formal semantics of natural languages and the study of cross-linguistic variation have nourished each other, have fed each other from the very beginnings of the formal semantics tradition. Then I will inspect the possible sites of cross-linguistic variation from the formal semantics perspective. And I will show how some aspects of meaning or some aspects of form meaning correlations are generally recognized as sites of variability, whereas others have never been real candidates for cross linguistic differences. I will then take up the idea of parametric variation among languages, and I will try to show how the research strategy based on the idea of a parameter has been applied in semantics in two cases. I will exemplify this with two cases. Uh, the first one is a rather successful attempt, and the second one is a rather unsuccessful attempt at parametric explanation of cross-linguistic differences. And we will try to derive the lesson that this story, I mean, both the success story and the unsuccessful story offer. And finally, if we get to that, uh, which I really doubt, I will introduce some recent research attempting to motivate and explain not variation itself, but unexpected convergences or parallels in the way some grammatical categories evolve in the diachronic uh, dimension. This is then our roadmap, and we start with the origins, with the historical background. I think we would all agree with Emon Back's perception that uh, the rise of the formal linguistics enterprise starts on the one hand with Chomsky's thesis, namely that English can be described as a formal system, that is formal sy syntax, and on the other hand with Montague's thesis that English can be described as an interpreted formal system that gives you, that adds the formal semantics dimension to, uh, the, to, to, to the syntax. Now, it is true that both these traditions uh, started uh, rather as you know, rather hostile uh, way to each other. Uh, and I remember, I think, Finan uh, referring yesterday to uh, the mean things that formal semantics uh, the, or that semanticians have to say uh, about a generative tradition. On my part, I believe really that uh, formal semantics uh, has been, let's say since the eighties, an, an integral part of the generative enterprise, of the generative enterprise. That's, that's the way I understand it. Even if this, yeah, I mean, uh, even if there was an undeniable uh, initial hostility between this, this, these two approaches, let's say of this, you know, between the East and the West Coast. 
So, uh, oh, sorry. Now, uh, if we substitute every natural language for English, we get something like every natural language can be described as an interpreted formal system. And this is obviously an ambiguous sentence. Now, the question is, how much may the formal systems with which we try to capture fragments of natural languages be expected to vary? Is there a single interpreted formal system able to describe any every natural language? Or is there, where are the, I, in, I mean, up to which point can the formal systems with which we try to describe uh, fragments of uh, natural languages be expected uh, to vary among themselves. Now, the methodological strategy that has been followed, and I think it is the only sound methodological strategy, is to expect very little variation, that is to say, to split a single formal system with a uniform interpretation and variation only at the fringes. Let's say, for instance, the fringes are the meanings of um, the interpretation of non-logical constants or this sort of thing. Now, this strategy has been very aptly summarized um, in Eamon Bach's slogan, shoot for the universe. In a more precise wording, you have what von Finter and Matthewson is right. Methodologically, we recommend that universality be in a null hypothesis only rejected case by case after extensive cross-linguistic checking. Now, this is the path of the research I would like to take you through for some selected topics in formal semantics. And the path of research uh, has to take uh, the following into consideration. At least superficially, natural languages differ from one another and many specific universal claims in formal semantics have been followed by extensive empirical work seeking contradictory evidence to these universal claims. Uh, and this is the path of research I will try to show you for some selected topics in formal semantics, which arose in the last decades of the 20th and uh, at the beginning of the, of, of, of the 21st century. Let us start with a very prominent example and a very prominent example is uh, the uh, NP quantifier universe. You know that starting with Montague, generalized quantifier theory became mainly, but not exclusively, through the work of Barwes and Cooper, a centerpiece in the development of formal semantics as a linguistic discipline, or if you want to for a central piece uh, that motivated the adoption of formal semantics by theoretical and descriptive linguists. Now, Ber Berwes and Cooper in their famous article formulated several universal claims, one of which, the NP quantifier universal, gave rise to an extremely fruitful strand of cross linguistic research. Uh, the NP quantifier universal uh, reads as follows Every natural language has syntactic constituents called noun phrases, whose semantic function is to express generalized quantifiers over the domain of discourse. Uh, now, cross-linguistic research looking for evidence against this universal started almost immediately after its formulation. Now, let us be clear what, about what sort of evidence it was looked for in this research. It is probably true that all languages have constituents that, uh, syntactic constituents that can be uh, describe it or that, that correspond to what we understand as a uh, noun phrases or, or, or determiner phrases in, in more modern parlance. It is rather probably that all languages have NPs, NDPs are syntactic constituents. And of course, it is trivially true that they can, that they are apt to be analyzed as generalized quantifiers, that is to say, a set of properties. This is simply so because the expressive power of generalized quantifiers is such that it is, uh, I mean, there is always the possibility of a, a, um, analyzing a, a noun phrase or a determinant phrase as a generalized quantifier. The idea, the, the problem is here if we need to do that. No? So what uh, people try to ascertain is, uh, what they thought we needed to know is whether for all languages, a uniform compositional account of noun phrases or determiner phrases, uh, 
was necessary in terms of sets of properties, sets of generalized quantifier. And the conjecture made very early by a group of researchers led, I would say, by, 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 by Barbara Hall Porky, the conjecture was that for some languages, an analysis of noun phrases or determinal phrases as entity denotations, or as, I mean, as referential expressions in, in common parlance, or as property denotations is enough, that we do not need, we, we, we needn't go for uh, sets of properties. So uh, the idea was then that some languages are where they lack essentially quantificational determinal phrases that they resort to a quantification instead. So what is this difference between uh, dequantification and a quantification? Uh, one gives you an example of dequantification. Uh, most quadratic equations uh, is a syntactic constituent, a determinal phrase such that if you want to assign this constituent a denotation, it will be that of a set of properties. And this is uh, one of uh, the determinal phrases, the syntactic uh, units or the syntactic entities, syntactic blocks that we would like to interpret as uh, uh, generalized quantifiers and that we call essentially quantificational DPs. Now, in two, you have uh, examples of what is called a quantification. As you see, uh, this is what you have in a quadratic equation usually has two solutions. When in Paris, Mary usually visits the Louvre, and Mary usually works, works to work. Uh, as you see in, the, in 2a, uh, the most plausible restriction on the area of quantification usually seems to be a DP, a quadratic equation. But the most plausible restriction in the second example seems to be occasions when Mary is in Paris. And in the third example, it seems to be occasions in which Mary goes to work. So essentially quantification and NPs are those that have to be analyzed as a determiner plus a restrictor set. An example is that of most quadratic equation, but probably all determiner phrases with asymmetrical determiners, I mean like every, and, uh, a, and proportional determiners like most and half of and so on, uh, are negative quantifiers also uh, are, mm, let's say, more reasonably treated as a set of properties than as entity denotations or property denotations. Whereas this sort of quantification uh, seems to be of a different nature, and it is of a different nature, particularly in what regards the mapping of syntactic structures, of syntactic constituents onto model theoretic objects or the model theoretic uh, interpretation. So in dequantification, uh, quantification is expressed by determiners, which are sister constituents to noun phrases. The restriction on quantification is syntactically determined in a straightforward way. And well, what I've already said, essentially quantificational, essentially quantificational determiner phrases are determiner phrases whose semantic contribution cannot be reasonably captured at the type of entities or at the type of properties, but only at the type of set of properties. Whereas a quantification is expressed by adverbs, but also may be expressed by affixes or by auxiliaries or by floating quantifiers, it relies semantically on a tripartite structure that can be diagrammed as quantifier, in our case, usually, a quantifying operator as usually, a restrictor, the quadratic equation, and a nuclear scope has two solutions on our first example. Uh, now, the important question is that uh, the mapping of syntactic structures onto this tripartite structure is not straightforward and raises very many compositionality issues. Hmm? So, uh, uh, one of the main reasons for the appeal of generalized quantifier theory was the need, the straightforward and uniform compositional solution it provided for the semantics of what we call today the terminal phrases. That is to say, I think uh, for many linguists, the possibility of ascribing the same semantic type to constituents as Mary, every girl, two thirds of the girls and so on, 
uh, was uh, constituents which have a rather similar uh, syntactic distribution. Uh, it was a main motivation for, I mean, for the enthusiasm at the beginnings with uh, generalized quantifier theory. Unfortunately, the more widespread, widespread form of quantification in natural languages seems to be a quantification. And a quantification is precisely the type of quantification that poses all sorts of problems of compositionality. The problems of compositionality are, for instance, how to build the restrictor and how to build the scope from the most obvious syntactic parsing of the sentence. If I may go back for a second. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, here, well, usually does not uh, form a constituent with uh, the expression that we may take as uh, acting as, a as providing the restrictor in quantification, which is a quadratic equation, but with an adequate subject predicate analysis, we might, uh, we might get away with it. In the second sentence in 2b, uh, we have an adjunct and the sentence radical, and well, it seems that uh, the restrictor to the quantifier is being provided to, uh, by, the, uh, by this adjunct. We might, get, we might get to form a syntactic analysis that allows us to express this. But if we go to the third example, Mary usually walks to work. I think the most plausible uh, reading of this example is that in occasions in which Mary goes to work, in most occasions in which Mary goes to work are occasions on which Mary walks to work. And here we are building the restrictor out of an entailment of the sentence. And this is a far cry from a straightforward mapping of syntactically well-established uh, constituents to uh, denotation. So the thing is that, uh, sorry. The thing is then that uh, even if when expressed by others of quantification and floating quantifiers, a quantification can be handled reasonably well by the generalized quantifier approach under the assumption that in the non-nominal domain quantifiers range over event eventualities and that a quantification played an important role in the general adoption of event semantics, uh, the overall picture that emerges from work uh, on, on on cross-linguistic uh, variation in this domain, is that not every language has quantificational determiners. That is that the NP quantifier universal of Barrows and Cooper in its strong version is falsified. What also seems to emerge is that, is that some form of a quantification, which is still nowadays much less well understood, seems to exist in all languages. But also an important result is uh, that uh, quantification of determiners and, determ and, and determiner phrases with the semantics of generalized quantifiers are not a typological rarity, but they seem to be rather well spread across uh, language families. This is the picture that emerges after 30 years of, I would say, extensive research on this issue. The research sparkled by Barwes and Cooper's formulation of the NP quantifier universal. So where are the sources for this? These are the sources. Uh, the collective work of many, many scholars over the years offers a fascinating picture of the many different ways in which relations between sets can be expressed in natural languages. And these are the main uh, sources where such what the the results of such collective work is, uh, has been uh, um, um, yeah, has, has been has been published. So this was the small uh, small historical example of how uh, informal semantics uh, you tend to make uh, very strong universal claims, and these strong universal claims can feed or nourish research on cross-linguistic variation uh, for, and can really improve in very, very important ways uh, what we know or, or the, the level of, let's say, subtlety and precision 
with which we describe a cross linguistic variation. Now, uh, let us turn to uh, my second part, my second, the second question, I, and it is the question of where the possible sites of cross linguistic variations in semantics are. The toy sentence in this slide is there just to remind you of where the possible sites of variation may be when you try to derive compositionally a model theoretic interpretation from a syntactically parsed structure, which is in principle the job of, of the formal semantics. No? That is to say, to attribute uh, a model theoretic denotation to each of the elements uh, to uh, have uh, rules of composition that allows you to proceed to give an interpretation to the merge of uh, any two categories here and to arrive at, I mean, the denotation of, uh, of the whole. This is just a toy example to remind you of where the possible sites of variation are. And if we look at that and uh, with, we, pay, we remember what I just said about uh, the building of uh, comp the compositional building of interpretation of, of structure, uh, we see that the possible sites of variation are, first of all, the model structure. Second, the inventory and the interpretation of the minimal building blocks. And these minimal building blocks are content words, such as soldier or die, and functional items, such as most, or the S for plural, or ED for past in our example. And uh, the other possible site of variation are syntactic structures. And finally, we might find variation in the syntax semantics, semantics mappings, either of syntactic categories or of composition rules. Now for model structure. Uh, the assumption that the model structure is universal has, as far as I know, never been challenged. I mean, the inventories of sorts of basic types diverge from one another, but this difference in the ontology have never, as far as I know, been tied to cross-linguistic variation. That is to say, you have researchers that may adopt a minimal ontology for the model, admitting only entities and truth values, or the ontologies may be more complex and uh, not only complex in the basic types, but also more complex in the sorts that might be further differentiated in one of the basic types. But to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever argued that the interpretation of language A requires a different model structure, a different inventory of basic types than the interpretation of language B. Uh, I mean, as I, as I say, as far as I know, this is, uh, this is a no-go, or this is something that nobody has thought about uh, or, or has uh, proposed or, or has proposed it. Now, as for the minimal building blocks, if we take content words such as soldier or die, there is general consensus as to the existence of possibly unconstrained variation in the interpretation of content words. In the words of Amfinton and Mathewson, languages differ almost without limit as to which meanings they choose to lexicalize. Uh, this is true, but it is not entirely true in as far as when we talk about categories of content words, even if variation in the lexicon of content words will widely vary, this that does not seem to be the case, and does not seem to be the assumption for semantic categories cutting across major lexical categories. That is to say, contrasts such as those between count and mass nouns uh, in, in, in the nominal domain, or the Vendrian classes among verbs, or the contrast between open scale and closed scale adjectives are assumed to be universal. So uh, there's a way of structuring the lexicon that seems to be uh, assumed to be universal at, by most practitioners, let's say, of, of formal linguistics. Now, it is important to note this, that those categorical distinctions in the lexicon of content worlds seem, that seem to be universal or that seem to be 
assumed to be universal, they do play a role in the grammar. That is, semantic categories cutting across major lexical categories are closely related to the syntax. And their identification relies mainly on their combination with exponents of functional categories and the effect these combinations uh, produce. I will briefly exemplify this with the English. This is, of course, again, a toy example. This is oversimplified. But uh, in, a certain, in a certain very, very simplified way, it is the distribution of plural morphology, among, of course, other things, that leads us in English to detect the difference between a mass noun as blood and a count noun as, child, as child with the plural children. It is the impossibility of combination with the progressive that leads to detect states. So it is, you cannot have, she's now in the answer. And it is the difference in the entailment patterns of these combinations with the progressive that leads us to distinguish between telic and atelic predicates, for instance. And then it is compatibility with uh, different types of degree modifiers that lead us to recognize different types of objectives. Of course, I repeat, these are oversimplified toy examples, but they are pointing in one direction that items of the inventory of functional categories, the setup, so to say, of the grammar are crucial for detecting what appear to be general categories structuring in a universal way, the infinite variability of content words. So what does it mean for a category to be universally present? Uh, I would like to go about this uh, for the venerable example of the mass count distinction. Let's start from the fact, what I take it to, to be a fact that uh, experimental work initiated in the nineties, it strongly suggests that there is a cognitive distinction between objects and substances that can be detected in the behavior of the prelinguistic child and possibly also in non-human primates. And that uh, this um, distinction is what appears in some way or other in the grammar. And now what may be the grammatical manifestations of this distinction? Uh, this grammatical manifestation of this distinction, they differ across languages. In languages with a grammatical singular plural contrast, mass nouns are not compatible with plural marking. And uh, interestingly, only languages with a singular plural contrast have what we call fake mass nouns, like furniture, which behave grammatically like mass nouns, but have a stable atomic structure. I mean, they are not cognitively mass nouns. They are not substances. They have atoms. They have atoms in the sense that a chair can be said to be furniture, but the leg of a chair or the back of a chair is certainly not furniture. It's not an instance of furniture, okay? So uh, in, interestingly, only these languages which have the singular plural contrast, uh, in them mass nouns cannot um, combine with the plural, but they also have, these languages seem also to be the only languages for which fake mass nouns have been uh, discovered. I mean, language uh, uh, nouns that uh, behave grammatically, whereas this, there is a sort of mismatch between the grammatical behavior of the noun and the cognitive uh, nature of what is uh, designated by the noun. Now, what about languages without the singular plural contrast? These languages tend to have classifier systems, that is, they tend to have particles, and this particles have to attach to a noun before they combine with a numeral or with a quantifier. Mandarin and Japanese are examples of this. These particles, the classifiers, are items of the functional inventory of the languages. And it is clear that in languages with rich classifier systems, some classifiers, shape-based ones and very generic ones, are not compatible with the class of nouns one may identify as mass nouns whereas other classifiers are compatible with common. That is to say, languages with rich classifier systems distinguish between individual classifiers, classifiers for cognitively um, count uh, uh, denotations, and standardized measures or container classifiers 
the latter may com combine with any type of noun, but individual classifiers or very generic classifiers can only combine with what are cognitively count nouns. Now, uh, what happens now in languages which apparently lack explicit functional vocabulary for the category of number? For them, it may be argued that only the cognitive, but not the grammatical distinction is actually there. That is, in languages without the singular plural contrast and without overt classifiers, combinations of numerals with mass nouns are either excluded, that is to say, you, don't, you cannot have something like three bloods, or they have a different interpretation than with count nouns. That is to say, you can say both three chairs and three bloods, but the interpretation of the combinations will be different you have a uniform atom-based interpretation for the cognitive count nouns versus a variable quantity interpretation with cognitive, what, what would count as cognitive uh, mass uh, entities. So up to now, we have seen that a modal structure is not a serious candidate for variation. Variation in the lexicon seems to be unconstrained, but for the universality of semantic categories cutting across major lexical categories, which are closely related to grammar. And now what about uh, variation in the possible syntax semantic mappings? Uh, there are two possible approaches to it, and there are actually two approaches to it. First, what we call the maker approach, that is the search for parametric correlations constraining variation. And second, the micro approach in which all variation is accounted for by differences in the form meaning association of lexical items and of exponents of functional categories. Now these variations in uh, the syntax semantic, semantic mappings are closely associated with the notion of semantic parameter. This is a notion that became rather popular in the 90s and has in the meantime lost some of its appeal. I'd like to illustrate this point with a rather successful and a rather unsuccessful attempt at discovering a semantic parameter. However, for, I'd like to stress that from the point of view of the dynamics of research, both attempts were useful at the moment, in the, independent from the fact that one was rather successful and the other one rather unsuccessful. The first parameter, the nominal mapping parameter is rather well known. It hypothesizes the existence of variation at the level of the mapping of elements of major lexical categories onto model theoretic entities. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, for this, uh, the, the parameter says that common nouns are born as predicates in some languages, but that they are born as denotations of individuals in other languages. The second proposal, the resultative parameter, as I said, is much less well known. It it hypothesizes that languages may differ in the availability of a very specific rule of composition. I am presenting them as examples of the way in which research strategies make progress. That is the main interest of this. That is to say, I'd like to stress the role of parametric variation in the heuristics in the way it has acted as a driving force for research. Now, how does parametric research proceed? First, you establish a correlation be between two or more covariating phenomena. Then you formulate an explanation for this correlation. You explore the predictions of the explanation. You examine contradictory evidence. And in general, you arrive at least at a much finer grained, yeah, at a much finer grained analysis, as this is as, at a much finer, at uh, a much preciser comprehension of the covariating phenomena. Now let us turn now to the uh, nominal mapping parameter. This hypothesis has two versions, the original 98 one and a more recent one. I will be presenting a sketch of the more recent version, but with elements of the older one, okay? Now, what are the correlations the, the nominal mapping parameter is designed to capture? Uh, the correlations are the following. In article languages with the grammatical singular plural contrast, bare count singulars are excluded from argument positions. Only bare plurals and bare mass nouns are acceptable in argument position. Uh, 
And at the same time, nouns may directly combine with numerals and with pontifaries. In classifier languages, all bare nouns may appear in argument position, but they may not directly combine with numerals. Here we have examples of the correlation for English. You see, you can have dinosaurs are extinct, bare plural in uh, argument position. Iron is a metal, a, a, a mass noun in an argument position, but you cannot have dog is a common animal. And in the same way, you can have something like he bought book. He can, you, can have, you cannot have something like he got, bought book, but you can have he bought books, he ate meat. And at the same time, I mean, uh, you have numerals that can combine directly with, uh, with uh, nouns. So no uh, bare singulars in argument position and the possibility of having bare plurals and uh, mass nouns in argument position correlate with the possibility of having, uh, of having uh, numerals attaching directly to nouns. And here we have the correlation for Mandarin for the second type of language. You have bare nouns like dog or book and so on are okay. So something like, I will try to write, to, to read this in, aloud in Mandarin because I don't know Mandarin, but uh, something that glosses as a dog love eat meat may mean that the dog loves to eat meat, that dogs love to eat meat, or that the dogs love to eat meat. And uh, half a buy go, book go, can mean that half a want to buy a book or books. Hmm? Now, the interesting thing is that a uh, bear count nouns like uh, dog and book may appear in argument position. And remember, we know they are count because they are the ones that may combine with individual classifiers, that is with shape-based classifiers, or like uh, this one, this is a shape-based quantifier, or with, a, 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 sorry, with individual classif classifiers like this one, and uh, they may also combine with a general classifier. So, and the other property that Mandarin has is that a, no noun can directly combine with a numeral. You need always this uh, particle, the, the, the classifier here, in order to have the combination. Now, this is the correlation that the nominal parameter uh, hypothesis is trying to, uh, to explain. And I will have to introduce now very briefly the minimal set of notions which are necessary for understanding this parametric explanation. I will try to do it on the basis of the canon properties uh, schema provided by Kierke. This minimal set of notions include next uh, to properties, which are sets or characteristic functions thereof, and uh, staple individuals. Next to this, uh, they include this, which is uh, a sort of entity, the kind. This is a sort of entity that is rather well established in the formal semantics approach to natural languages, since work by Greg Carlson in the 70s. The kind of thing is a singular entity that manifests itself in staple individuals. The staple individuals can be conceived as realizations of a kind, but a kind is a singular entity. Let's say that a kind is what cats can be taken to refer to in sentences such as cats are extinct or cats and tigers have a common ancestor or cats are widespread. Hmm? So the kind is what is represented here by the small c at the top. Um, the singular and this singular entity is uh, represented or conceived as the maximal sum this year hmm, of all the staple individuals. This is the world which only contains uh, three cats, okay? This is the maximal sum of all the staple individuals of which the singular predicate cat can be truthfully asserted at a given word. This is this entity you have to write that would correspond. This is a singular entity, uh, but it is, let's say, composite of its realization, but it behaves as a singular entity. 
Now, this notion of sum as a particular sort of entity is standard in the treatment of plurals also since work by Godehard Link in the 80s. And the original assumption is that plural nouns, that was the original assumption of Link, plural nouns denote in a partially ordered set like this, huh? in a partially ordered domain, which is either isomorphic to the power set of individuals minus the empty set or to an atomic joint semi-lattice. Hmm? So you see, this is a structure that has a minimal level of entities and has a maximal uh, entity for them. So uh, this is the structure of the uh, plural or number neutral property cat, that is the capital cat here, which is a cat which doesn't still have singular or plural morphology. It is cat in the lexicon without specification for singular or plural, without specification for, plu for, for number. That's why it is called I mean, a number neutral and it gives rise to this uh, number neutral property. Mm. So um, the innovative idea here is precisely this, that this cat in capitals as a lexical item before the intervention of singular and plural morphology does not denote a set of individual cats but it denotes uh, the set of individual cards plus all the joints that you can make on the basis of the set of individual cards. So number, so number neutral predicates denote this joint semi-lattice or a set theoretical version of it. Next, we have some operations. We have the at, at for atom operation that gives you the set of individuals. And this is what in English corresponds to what singular number does. And uh, uh, this uh, operation can be reversed, so to say, by the plural or star operator, hmm, which gives you simply the closure under SAM of this set of individuals here. So furthermore, we have two functions that connect the number neutral cat property to the kind little c here. And these are the up operator on the left hand side, this one. This gives you, uh, takes um, a kind here and gives you the corresponding number neutral property. And the down operator here takes the number neutral property and gives you the entity, the corresponding entity, the kind. For mass nouns, in principle, the same apparatus is uh, available, but uh, with a major difference. The atom function here will be, unless otherwise constrained, will uh, give you uh, nothing comparable to a disjoint set of entities. Why? Well, because mass nouns cognitively lack a stable atomic structure. That means to say that there is no context independent answer to the question as to what a minimal instance of the rice property is. And this is the signature property of uh, mass nouns. This is now reduced to the bare essentials, a very short explanation of the elements that are necessary in order to understand what is meant by the nominal mapping parameter. Now, what does the nominal mapping parameter actually say? Uh, what the nominal mapping parameter says is that languages differ in the semantic type at which ends and noun phrases are born. In languages like English, uh, nouns are born as properties, denote in type ET. I, I mean, they are expressions of type ET, and they are born at, uh, at this level here. Okay. Whereas, in predicates like Mandarin, dubbed plus argument minus predicate arguments, nouns denote kinds are of type E, sort K, that is, let's say, uh, in English, uh, the noun cat will start its life here. Whereas in Mandarin, the noun cat will start its life here on this part of the triad. Okay? So, Languages that differ in the semantic type at which nouns are born. In a minus argument languages like English, nouns denote properties. In 
plus argument predicates, uh, plus argument languages like Mandarin nouns uh, denote kinds, hmm, are of type E, sort K. That is to say, in a way, that English is a property-oriented language and uh, Mandarin is a kind-oriented language as far as the denotation, the original denotation uh, or um, the, the, the type at which noun denotation is born. What is the parametric explanation now? Uh, how does it work? Uh, in languages uh, with uh, nominus and in argument position cannot be properties. Uh, properties have to be lowered into ECA type, into, into the type of kinds by the down operator in order to occupy an argument position. But the down operator is only defined for domains with the maximal entities. Now, the problem is that singular properties like cat in the singular in English do not have a maximal element. So this is how we well, uh, the nominal Para mapping parameter explains that a dog is a common animal is impossible, he bought book is impossible, whereas dogs uh, are barking, or he bought dogs, or uh, dogs uh, and uh, cats uh, do not have a common ancestor are possible, and uh, why iron is a common substance and he bought iron are possible. Uh, mass counts and uh, pardon, uh, mass uh, nouns in the plural of uh, of count nouns, they uh, denote in a domain that has a maximal entity. And what this operator here, the down operator wants or needs, can only be defined. Uh, this function can only be defined in a domain that has this sort of maximal entity. And as you see, something like cat in the singular does not have a, a, a maximal entity. So down operator can be applied, but gives, but outputs you nothing. It's undefined in these circumstances. So and now, uh, as this is, this is explanation why a singular count nouns cannot appear in argument position. Now, uh, about what about the explanation for uh, the way Mandarin functions? Uh, we can assume that uh, since uh, all nouns are born at the entity type, at the kind type, or as kind denoters in Mandarin, they ha will have no problem to appear in argument position. And this is what appears here. I mean, I mean, any type of noun, be it a mass noun or being a count noun, may appear in argument position. Hmm? But uh, these languages require at the same time classifiers hmm? they, uh, for, in order for the nominals to combine with a numeral. And the idea is here that kind denoting nominals cannot combine with numerals. Numerals will simply take properties uh, and give you other type of properties. Numerals are conceived here as property modifiers. Hmm? And uh, uh, well, then we will need classifiers for lifting kind denoting expressions into property denoting expressions. Hmm? So what classifiers would do is to provide additionally, I mean, the first things to do is to change the type as to make this uh, unit here be compatible with uh, three, which is requiring a property denotation. And additionally, what the classifiers do is they provide sets of natural atoms for count nouns, or they provide various measure units for any noun. So uh, this is the explanation for why classifier languages need classifiers and why they allow all nouns to appear in argument positions. So you see that the correlations we started with at the beginning seems to be quite well accounted for by the nominal marking parameter. Now there is a further dimension of variation among languages that has to do with the existence of articles and their features in a given language. In a language that, like Spanish, for instance, uh, you simply, it, I mean, it is a singular plural language with a singular plural distinction, but it is pretty clear that no noun may appear in certain argument positions uh, without a determiner. I mean, there are no bare plurals and no mass nouns. And in a language like Russian, which, like Russian, which also has singular plural distinction, uh, argument positions can apply like any, uh, I mean, I can apply to any um, uh, 
I'm sorry, a, 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 any sort of noun can, can apply in an argument position, be it a count noun, or like here you have count nouns in argument position that seem to pose no problem. No? So this is also not predicted by the nominal mapping parameter. These distributions here, neither the distribution of Spanish nor the distribution of Russian can be explained by the nominal mapping parameter. So uh, why should this uh, be so? Uh, Brenda, you yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, the distribution of bare nominals in Spanish and Russian has little to do with the nominal mapping parameter. It has a lot to do with the inventory of functional words, such as articles. More precisely, it is determined by the existence or non-existence of um, a definite and indefinite article first, and then with the features of the definite article with, when it exists. The reason why Russian behaves as it does is that Russian does not have articles. Since Russian has not, does not have articles, it is free to covertly apply all these three um, type shifting operations that allow you to go from a property denotation into a denotation that is apt to function in argument position will be the iota type shifter that uh, takes a property and gives you a single entity corresponding to the property or the single entity of which this property is true or the maximal entity to which the property is true. Uh, it can be something like uh, the existential, which gives you an existential quantifier leading on a noun, something that can may also appear in argument position, or it can be the our by now familiar down, which is defined as an intentionalized iota that is it's something that takes a property and if you give it and gives you some you give you something such that if you give it a world gives you uh, the entity the maximal entity that corresponds to that property in in the world hmm? so uh, these are the possible type shifting operations that regulate the to and fro between kinds and properties if a language like Russian has no articles that serve to express, for instance, the iota operator or the, uh, or the down operator or the existential quantifier, it will be free to apply these type shifting operations covertly. Hmm? Uh, but if a language does have some sort of determiner that expresses for any set what uh, the type shifters do here, then it will not be able to do the operation covertly, I mean, without a determiner, because of the blocking principle that tells you that type shifting is a last resort, you cannot do covertly what you can do overtly, so that for any type shifting operation, tau and any x, it, tau and x is not well formed if there is a, I mean, it's not applicable, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't use it if there is a determiner d such that for any set x in its domain, uh, you have an equivalence between what the covert operator, the covert type shifter does and what this determiner does. So what is the idea then? That the English definite article express only iota and therefore the down operator may be covert and this down operator will all, always, always on, only be defined for mass nouns and plurals. The Romans definite article expresses both iota and the down operator and therefore uh, the down operator may not be covert. And uh, Russian has neither a definite nor indefinite article therefore all type shifting operations may be covert. Hmm? So this blocking principle seems uh, quite a reasonable principle. Hmm? And uh, now, What is the overall uh, picture that emerges here? The overall picture that emerges here is that the main typological difference is not between languages with and without articles, but between languages with grammatical number and languages with classifiers. And the parameter and the variation is actually lexical. It concerns the four meaning associations of content words and the inventory and features of items in the functional vocabulary. I mean, the inventory features, classifiers, number morphology, and article. Mm -hmm. So over and above, and this seems to, this is important because this seems to substantiate the Borrow-Chomsky's conjecture 
The Borel-Konchamsky conjecture being that all parameters of variation are attributable to differences in features of particular items. For instance, but not exclusively, the functional heads in the lexicon. So over and above uh, the elegance of this hypothesis and the elegance is that it tries to explain what looks like maddening variation with a rather simple idea that Chinese nouns start their life as entity denotations, whereas English nouns start their lives as properties. I mean, over and above this, uh, this elegant property, there is a further, there has been a further very positive aspect uh, to uh, the nominal mapping hypothesis, and it is that it has driven research for decades by guiding linguists as to what to search for, for in a language. So apparently contradictory evidence to the nominal mapping parameter has driven research for uh, over two decades and uh, has led us to examine problematic cases as those of languages with a singular plural contrast and definite and indefinite article, which nonetheless exhibit count singulars in argument position, or languages with a grammaticalized classifier system that seem to have plural marking, or languages with a singular plural contrast that have three combinations of numerals with nouns and apparently lack uh, classifiers. Hmm? So uh, these uh, are prima facie contradictory evidence to the normal mapping parameter. parameter. Uh, and uh, we know much more about, we have, we have much more precise, refined and in-depth analysis of these languages. We know much more about these languages because of uh, the existence of the nominal mapping parameter hypothesis. It is something that has driven research in, a, I would say, in a, in a magnificent way. Hmm? So I'll just, uh, let me say that, uh, just that you are, so that you are not much disappointed, the really hard case here seems to be Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, the other two cases uh, seem to be more easily accounted for in, without abandoning the, the, nominal, the nominal mapping parameter hypothesis. Mm. Uh, Brazilian Portuguese, must, it must also be said that it is a non-stable system. It has a lot of interlinguistic variation. Speakers' in, intuitions vary as to when and with, in, with which meaning a bare singular cons can be used, how they can be interpret, interpreted. So here, uh, Brazilian Portuguese is uh, a, a big counter argument, I mean, it's, it's important contradictory evidence to the nominal mapping parameter, but this evidence is not crystal clear. I do not think we understand entirely what is happening here. What is happening in Korean as well, this plural marking is, has very different properties from the, from the plural of, uh, from, from the function of plural marking in more, in better described languages. And, uh, and here it might be that the apparent uh, no, non-existence of the classifier means simply that it is a, a, a covert uh, classifier. So now, uh, so independently of the fact that it may eventually be proven wrong, the hypothesis of nominal marking parameter has been extremely fruitful. We have obtained much more precise and in-depth descriptions of an impressive array of languages of different families by looking at evidence that could falsify the nominal mapping parameter. Now, in the uh, three minutes that I have left, uh, I will simply show you without, uh, of course, going into it, uh, what has, because I would like to show you the consequence uh, of this, uh, what, what a, I mean, what the final moral of this is. Uh, the, the other parametric explanation I wanted to, to talk about today uh, is also for a case of correlating variation, it, and it goes directly against uh, Frege's conjecture that the only semantic composition rule is unary functional application. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, the postulation of the resultative parameter hypothesis suppose that there is a rule of composition in which languages like English which some languages like English have, which have directed motion events with verbs manner and prepositional phrases and which have resultative construction. And that this rule of composition is not available in languages, let's say, such as Spanish, which lack constructions with these properties. So that you see directed motion events, uh, uh, what is in green is the 
what gives you the direction. And as you see, the way information is distributed across the sentences is entirely different in English and Spanish. In English, you have a prepositional goal phrase that uh, can attach practically to any manner of movement verb and give you the goal of movement. In Spanish, normally, uh, it, you have this uh, lexicalized, the di um, direction of movement is lexicalized in the verb in the manner is, if at all, uh, then expressed by express it uh, by, by adjuncts. But the important thing is Spanish is apparently unable to form this sort of construction. And is, Spanish is also unable to form this sort of construction, what we call resultative constructions. Here you have a predicate indicating the result state at which the object is as a consequence or uh, as a consequence of the action uh, designed by the verb. And as you see, this sort of construction is possible in English. It is absolutely, ex absolutely up to a certain point excluded in, in Spanish. So the correlation here for the resultative parameter is uh, the existence of directed manner of motion events with this sort of constellation and the existence of resultative constructions, which are possible in a certain type of language and are impossible in another type of language. Now, some people have suppose that uh, uh, the reason for this is that languages that uh, uh, have uh, resultative constructions and uh, goal, uh, uh, goal prepositional phrases indicating the goal of movement with any sort of uh, manner of motion verb uh, have a particular composition rule that uh, uh, does not exist in the other languages. Uh, so this principle here is a particular rule of composition. And what it, what it does is to glue together a relation between entities and time, I mean, a V denotation and a small close denotation. And it does this by introducing the operators cause and become. So principle error, this rule of composition is a sort of way of creating accomplishment uh, predicates uh, in the syntax. Uh, now, uh, this does not seem to be a very attractive notion that languages may differ in the rules of composition. But this is not for me a very attractive rule. Uh, let me add, however, that uh, even if, if it is true that such, a, that just such a thing as the resultative parameter exists, if you do not account for it in the semantics, you will have to account it in the syntax. And uh, this also gives you not always very palatable solution. But now the point regarding this, uh, the, the resultative parameter, the existence of a particular rule of composition for languages like, let's say the Germanic languages that is not shared by other languages that allows them to create accomplishment predicates in the syntax by this sort of monster we, we just saw. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, further research on this, on the correlation assumed in the resultative parameter has shown that simply this correlation does not hold. There are languages with the directed motion, directed motion manner constructions, constructions, but that do not have resultative constructions. There are languages that have resultative constructions, but do not have a directed manner of motion constructions. That is, there are languages for which a structure like one is okay but a structure like two is impossible. And the other way around, there are languages that have constructions like two, the resultative, but do not have the direct manner of motion. And more importantly, even more important than that, there are lexically determined splits both in directed manner of, manner of motion constructions and in resultative constructions. So that for some languages, very general movement, uh, motion verbs like uh, run admit the manner of the, the, the goal of motion construction, whereas other more specific do not admit it. And uh, some languages ac accept uh, or uh, can form, can build resultative constructions uh, with uh, the, what uh, is called the weak type, uh, Mary wiped the table clean, but they cannot be it. They, they cannot build resultative construction with what we call the strong type. What is the moral of this? Uh, the moral of this is that uh, uh, 
research on possible variation in syntax semantics mappings initiated by the assumption of semantic macroparameters tend to uncover empirical evidence that substantiates the borrow chomsky conjecture. And the borrow chomsky conjecture repeats now as all parameters of variation are attributable to differences in features of particular items. That is to say, in the uh, functional uh, heads uh, in, the, in the lexicon. Mm -hmm. in, this, in, the, in, the, in the previous case, the variation, in, in the case of the nominal mapping parameter, what was assumed is that there is variation in the way in which nouns map uh, onto model theoretic entities, and then the, the preference for kinds or for predicates for nouns, which are lexical items, and uh, the existence or non-existence of some exponents of functional categories and the semantics of these particular items. And this is exactly what is countenanced by the borrow chomsky conjecture. And in the case of uh, the resultative parameter, well, uh, the correlations, the parameter was built on, the, the, the parametric explanation was built on, seem not, simply not to hold. I mean, what we find is that variation, let's say, at the micro, uh, at the micro level, hmm? at the micro uh, level of the inventory and meaning uh, of elements uh, of functional and of, uh, uh, of uh, elements of functional categories and of contentables. Well, we will not arrive at constraint variation and regular change in the meanings of exponents of functional categories. That was in a way um, to be expected. I mean, so I had, uh, I had in a way uh, thought that it would be like this. So I'm sorry. I want to arrive at the, uh... thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, that was very informative and interesting. If you have questions for Brenda, please raise your hands. Julie. Julie, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think I, I'm, thank you so much. It was very interesting and some of these were very thought provoking and I'll, you, I'll ask you a question about that. This is about variation in, uh, in the models. Mm -hmm. So if I understood you correctly, you kind of don't want to put variation there. I was thinking about things like systems like uh, Martina Vilchko's system that she does her syntax differently, well, initially for uh, indigenous languages like Blackfoot, mm -hmm. that she does not construct the, the, our, our kind of traditional syntactic structure, uh, but has functional categories in the syntax that map kind of directly into pragmatic. So she has, instead of having a proposition and having time, let's say tense there, she has anchoring to um, special speci special uh, um, domains or something. So that her idea was to kind of do, some, do pragmatic directly in syntax. I don't know uh, any attempts to make, to write uh, semantics for her system but I was thinking that your idea would definitely require a kind of different model, at least for, 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 the, for the types. That's kind of one part of the question. And the second part of the question is, again, it's around the same idea of modeling, of, of, of the model. And as far as I understood, you were talking about variation only in terms of cross-linguistic variation, like languages. But what if we think about variation, uh, like a, taking acquisition as kind of variation and taking, um, let's say people with different mental 
um, disabilities and deviances as another kind of variation, which also come to uh, may or may come to differentiating, or at least for me, it will be very attractive to account for, for these variations as variations of different models. Mm -hmm. So, I so can elaborate, well, but I think you can. Uh, get the... uh, thank you very much for your question. I mean, it is a very thought-provoking question. The first thing I have to say as to that is that I am not familiar with this uh, part of the work of Martina Velsko. No? So I, I, I won't be able to say anything uh, about that. Uh, the, and what I was trying to point out, and I think I stressed that, is that I am not aware of anybody having proposed a solution, say language A has this inventory of basic types and language B has this other, let's say for instance, in order to describe language A, we need degrees. In order to describe language B, we do not need degrees. No? As far as I know, this has not been proposed. No? And of course, this concerns the basic types, the way functions are formed, what we know. Uh, I mean, uh, once 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 you start with the machinery, I mean, it's uh, yeah. There's there's there's. I don't think there is a principled way of saying no. This this sort of function is possible. This other is not because the language behaves etc. I, I do not think so. But as I said, I am not uh, I'm not familiar at all with this part of the work of, of Martina Velsko, so I I won't be able to to have a response to that. In as so for cross linguistic variation, I don't, I don't know. Please correct me if I if I didn't understand if I didn't understand uh, what you meant by your question, uh, because you see sometimes you tend to hear questions in the way you are thinking <laughs> the question and not in the way the question Absolutely. was formulated. Okay, so uh, but uh, uh, I mean when I refer uh, and this is this is what uh, what has been started and. In the, what, what I think is great work that has been done by, by people doing typological research in the, in, in the formal semantic framework or with the, with the help of the formal semantics toolkit. Uh, of course, they have concentrated on uh, variation uh, across languages, as what, whatever sort of entities uh, languages are. But of course, this sort of thing uh, should be explored also uh, for Brenda, are you there? Uh, I think she lost her connection, maybe. Um, yeah, I was not wondering. I, I was wondering whether it's my connection. Probably it's her if you're yeah. experiencing that. So she is not among the participants, right? In the list. She's not that I'm not seeing her. So that is so then she is gone temporarily. Oh, I know she is, she is. She is. Brenda, are you here? She's probably reconnecting. Yes. Brenda, we cannot see. Okay. No. And you hear me? I'm sorry, there was a problem with, with the cable of my internet connection. I'm very sorry about that. So, um, no, uh, what, uh, what I was saying, uh, I was asking Julie if she would agree with me that, uh, let's say, uh, the variations, uh, I mean, the sort of uh, linguistic competence that emerges uh, in acquisition uh, could be considered as a sort of uh, in, in the same way as cross-linguistic variation is? I don't know. I, um, I don't have, uh, I don't have a, a horse in this race. I don't know. So I'm, I will be open to say yes. And mm -hmm. I will be open for people who try to show me that, no, 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 they have absolutely different origins and need to be accounted absolutely differently. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a very synchronic person, so I yeah. 
say. No, I don't have. You, I don't have anything to say. You, 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 you see, I, I am not. Uh, I'm not very familiar with work on, on acquisition, but with some work on acquisition, yes. And uh, well, some people wouldn't uh, object to saying that, uh, let's say, French. Uh, uh, I mean, children learning French at the age of uh, three, let's say have a tense system or a way of in interpreting sequence of tense that is very similar to a non-sequence of tense language of Japanese. Okay. So let's say, I'm, this, is, this is really grossly formulated, but uh, uh, that uh, uh, children learning the French tense system pass through a stage in which their comprehension and their prediction is very similar to Japanese, which is a non-sequence of tense language. Okay. That's, that's, uh, I don't know if that is, if that uh, goes. So I, I, I probably, yeah, I probably wanted you to say more on what you think should or should not be a variation at the model level like or, or what, what's what, what's your thoughts on it like i i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't want to i, I mean personally i wouldn't want yeah. to work scientifically <laughs> with different I, I wouldn't want to work with uh with uh, with uh, different basic types for different varieties of language whether the I, whether there are full-fledged historical languages, or whether there are, um, let's say, uh, learner varieties, or whether there are uh, previous um, previous um, varieties of, uh, I mean, diachronically uh, previous varieties to to, to non-languages. I, I I wouldn't I, I wouldn't like to think that. Uh, that uh, let's say that, that that the system of basic types that that would that we would need to suppose that there are system of that that I mean that these people work with different basic entities. You see, this this would go. I mean, maybe I'm 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 not thinking right here, but this would go in the way of of, of Sapir Wharf and so on, and we know that. That doesn't lead. Uh, that doesn't lead very far. Very far. So. Do you think we have a principled way to test whether it can be the case or not? Uh, it's not no. that I have in mind. No, I, no, 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 I no, 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 no. I don't think so. No, can... no, no. I, I, I mean, correct me, but I, I don't think. I think it would be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Apart, let's say, from the sort of. Uh, Methodological uh, commitment, or whatever, but that, that you may have, or uh, or intellectual, let's say, commitment that, that you may have or not. Uh, but it, I think it would be extremely difficult to judge between a solution that to a to, to a problem of variation that appeals to quite convoluted and complicated things in the syntax or in the semantics. And a solution that does the same thing, but saying, well, look, it is very simple here. We have an extra basic type in the model that allows it to us. I think that it would be empirically very difficult. But I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm thinking wrong and maybe I, uh, but I, have not, uh, I have not thought of all the possibilities. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's... Thank you, thank you. Great. I do have a question for you, Brenda. Um... Yeah, thank you, David. Correct me if I am wrong, but in, in the case of um, quantifiers, I, I see the following pattern uh, based on what you were explaining. Mm -hmm. So formal semanticists uh, tend to begin with a very abstract and power powerful formal system, such as unrestricted uh, mm -hmm. generalized quantifier mm -hmm. theory. And then they impose restrictions on the mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. so that uh, the restricted version of the system mm -hmm. fits the empirical data, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like a pretty relevant empirical observation, and does not overgenerate. Mm -hmm. And in the, the same pattern may emerges uh, in the case of 
um, semantic type theory. So you begin with very abstract and general type theory with no restrictions, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. impose mm -hmm. restrictions based on mm -hmm. the observations mm -hmm. you make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, fine and, and, mm -hmm. and it's okay. But interestingly, in the case of um, composition rules, mm -hmm. it seems that the procedure is the opposite one. So um, semantics begin with being very, very conservative with just one composition rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With just one composition rule. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they try to keep us as conservative as possible by not posting other roles. So it seems that in this case, they are applying the opposite general procedure. And I was wondering what's the, like, the motivation for, for this difference. But, uh, uh, this, is, this is a very nice, uh, this is a very nice observation. And David, I, I hadn't thought of it. Huh? Uh, what is uh, the explanation maybe would be that, well, you are sure that you have uh, a single syntactic operation that is merged, <laughs> and you want to have the single syntactic operation it straightforwardly correspond uh, to something, and this something is functional application. That I, I mean, that seems to it, that, that, that that would seem to be the that would seem to be um, the best uh, mapping you may have. For generating uh, the interpretations for for complex structures, and uh, I mean, if I may, if I introduce this, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to research done in the way of this uh, of this resultative parameter. But I do not. I mean, I, I the thing is that what research, empirical research, has uncovered up to now is that simply the initial correlation doesn't hold. So if, if the initial empirical correlation doesn't hold, it's, uh, it's not worthwhile, <laughs> I mean, to, to enrich uh, your system, let's say, but with, with, with a little monster like the, like, 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 like the air printer. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Yes, it's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there more questions? Please raise your hands if you have questions. Um, Anna Clara. So hi, thank you, Brenda. Very, very hi. nice. I have I have a question that is <clears throat> related to the second one. I think that Julie uh, asked. Mm -hmm. uh, let's imagine that we can account for, and I'm going to go into something more linguistic. Mm -hmm. uh, account for diachrony in pretty okay. much the same way as you as you account for cross-linguistic variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what would happen in a case where you're in the same uh, language state but you approach a problem such as language uh, a process of change in language in where you have two different um, rules for the same thing I mean, and I was thinking, for instance, in the very classical example in Spanish of the haber impersonal, you know, mm -hmm. and the concordado. How would you, mm -hmm. for that coexistence of two different rules? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, this, this, I think, has to do more with, with syntax when, than with semantic variation, isn't it? Because, I mean, uh, what uh, Anna Clara is referring to is uh, that uh, uh, in uh, some varieties of Spanish, uh, you, I mean, in the, in the standard variety of Spanish, let, let, let's try to make it uh, as simple as possible. In the standard uh, variety of Spanish, uh, you say as well, there is a person, uh, and you might say there is persons, okay? so. You use as you have to use uh, for the existential construction a singular. In English, you have there is a person, there are people. Hmm? I mean, the, sta in the standard uh, Spanish construction for that would require always to have a singular, singular marking on the on the verb. But most of us uh, go the English way and and make our existential predicate uh, agree in number. With the argument, okay, and so uh, Anna is saying there are 
two two different rules there. There and yes, there are. First of all, there is no problem of um, I, I see no problem in two rules coexisting in the same population, not even in, in the say in the same rule. I mean, in two different rules coexisting in the same speaker, in the same individual. And uh, so, and the second uh, point is that uh, this sort of agreement phenomenon is a very superficial agreement phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, very, I mean, very superficial, and I think that it doesn't seem to affect, it doesn't seem to affect uh, something. Uh, the, 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 the syntactic structure in, 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 any, in any very deep way. I am thinking of something I, I don't want to say, <laughs> but I will say it. <laughs> I mean, based on these facts and on other facts coming from impersonal sentence uh, agreement in Spanish where you wouldn't expect it, people are saying that this, that actually, I mean, what you have in, in the syntax is a non-agreeing construction and that you superficially put agreement markers. You may superficially put agreement marks that do really nothing to the to the structure. If you are interested in that, I can I can I can pass you the, the reference uh, afterwards. So the idea is, uh, can uh, I mean, can two different rules uh, coexist? Uh, language with two different rules coexist in the same in the same community? Yes, I think they coexist all the time. Okay. Is it possible for one single individual to have two slightly different grammars in their, in their brains, so to say? Yes, I, I think it is also the case. And I think it will be very difficult to understand the uh, variation. And this is, this is some, I think this is something, Julie, maybe you can help us there, that has been an assumption, for instance, in, in acquisition. No? I mean, the, multi, the, the multiple grammar hypothesis in acquisition, no? that at a certain point, in the development of language acquisition, an individual may have, may be playing with two competing grammars. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm not there. Sorry, I just wanted to, resp to respond to that. Oh, I'm, I'm not very you. aware about linguistics, uh, about the acquisition, but it's definitely a hypothesis in bilingualism and uh, those studies, at least one of the hypotheses there. You mean the, the multiple grammar hypothesis? Mal multiple grammar Mal hypothesis yes, yes, and yes, bilingualism yes, and yes, multilingualism. Yes, 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 yeah, for yes, them, yes, those, yes, that's yes, definitely yes, a, yes. what people are working on. Yes, yes. But, we might, yes but we might suppose that in the, in the end of that, uh, all of us, even the monolinguals, are bilinguals in a very, very, very uh, modest way huh? by admitting uh, grammars with. Uh, what is multiple variation for the lexicon? This is this is very clear. I mean, the properties in the lexicon vary from one speaker to other to another, and, and maybe for for more fundamental categories. Okay, it's almost time to end. We have two minutes left. If uh, anybody wants to add something or that's a follow up, we have time. Um, if not, then um, Brenda, thank you very much. Uh, for thank you, talk. thank you all. Thank you all very much. Um, and we will resume in 20 minutes. So I'll see you in 20 minutes. <laughs>